Hi, everyone, and welcome to this month's installment of Teaching Space with NASA. My name is Brandon Rodriguez. I work in the education department at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Very excited to have you guys back. Uh, if you've joined us before, um, and if this is your first time, thanks a lot for tuning in. Um, what we'll be talking about today is uh, the Deep Space Network, which I'm very, very excited about our speaker, Bernardo Lopez, who's going to run us through um, a little bit about how it is we communicate with our spacecraft uh, across the solar system. Um, before we turn it over to him, I wanted to highlight just a couple things. Um, first and foremost, uh, it's the apocalypse and uh, California is on fire. So uh, as a result, normally we have some uh, some studio support. We are able to, to go into the lab and, and work from there. Um, unfortunately, because of the, the fact that we can't get access to the laboratory, we're effectively running this off our personal Wi-Fi today. So we didn't want to cancel on you guys um, and really wanted to make sure that this uh, uh, event still happened. So we've got our miracle worker, Lyle Tavernier, uh, uh, effectively building a TV studio in his home. And I hope that you guys will bear with us if there are any technical or audio issues as, as we move forward. Um, a, uh, another really important thing to cover is that this is, uh, I believe, the fourth uh, installment of this. And in, in the past, we really focused on Mars and the Perseverance rover. And that's because leading up to the launch, this was really a, a critical focus. But it's important to note that Mars is, is while an important piece, really a very small piece of everything that JPL does. So to that end, it's, it's really important that we finally focus a little bit more on the infrastructure, the engineering that allows for all of these space missions to take place. And to, to that, I think we'll, we'll really enjoy exploring some of these uh, uh, future research missions to allow us to even further expand how it is we do what we do at NASA. Um, as usual, we'll, we'll have our guest speaker run us through uh, some slides and, and give us a little bit of a technical perspective. We'll do about 10 or 15 minutes of Q&A. I hope you guys registered. You still can um, for the uh, live stream questions. Uh, if you're just watching, absolutely fine. And we're happy to have you here. But if you'd like to have your questions answered, you want to um, <clears throat> make sure you register on the Teaching Space website. Um, at the end of that, we'll cover a little bit of education slides and some resources so that you can take this lesson to your students or to your kids at home uh, to kind of further develop uh, some of the material that we covered today. So uh, with that being said, let me please uh, turn it over to Bernardo Lopez and uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Hello everyone. As you've heard today, I will talk to you about NASA's Deep Space Network, which is the project I work on. Um, so the Deep Space Network, let's see. So to get started, perhaps you have been amazed at the pictures of views dust storms or dust devils forming on the surface of Mars, or the amazing close-up pictures of the planets taken by, taken by spacecraft like Voyager, Galileo, Cassini, Cassini, and many others. And who can forget the surprising and awe-striking finding of geysers on Saturn's moon Enceladus by Cassini in 2015, or the sharp images of the antennae galaxies in the group we call NGC 3048, sent to us by Hubble uh, Telescope uh, and many others. Well, all those images, as did the voices of astronauts from the Apollo missions during uh, the, our visits to the moon, have come to us through the deep space network antennas. Those antennas make up NASA's DSN. You know, today, you can just pick up your cell phone and call your grandparents or your parents, send a text message to your friends, or connect via Skype uh, or uh, WebEx, etc., to one of your uh, classes. Well, NASA has a way to connect with the many spacecraft we send to explore our solar system and the universe. As you may have guessed by now, that is through our deep space network antennas. So what is the deep space network? 
it is the messaging, the communication link, the connection between Earth and our exploration spacecraft in deep space. It is a team of radio telescopes or antennas located at three stations around the world. You may ask yourself, what is deep space? Well, deep space is a distance far enough from Earth such that our spacecraft will always be in view of one of our antenna stations. Another definition is a distance of two million kilometers from Earth. Either way, that is very, very far away. So what type of information do we communicate or exchange with our spacecraft? Well, from them, we receive science data, observations like photos, data files, or voice in, uh, at the time of the Apollo missions, experiment results, spacecraft health information, instruments, diagnostics, fault error uh, or fault or just error messages. And very important, the location and navigation information of the spacecraft so that we always know where they are and where to point our antennas to so that we can talk to them. So from us to them, we send commands for tests and diagnostics, navigation corrections, task preparation, task changes, instrument activation and activity commands, or requests for diagnostics, and sometimes even reprogramming of one of their computer systems if necessary. We go to slide eight, we can see that in the DSN, we have two basic antenna sizes. One with a main reflector of 70 meters in diameter, which weighs some 9 million pounds above its supporting concrete pedestal. And the others are 34 meters in, diameters, uh, in diameter. And for these, we have two designs. The older one, which we call the uh, high efficiency antenna, and the newer design known as the beam waveguide antenna. And these weigh approximately a bit less than a million pounds each. We have one 70 meter antenna per station and also a HEF, which we are slowly retiring from service nowadays, and two to three beam waveguides and beam waveguide antennas per station. On slide eight, I mean nine, you will see that, as I said, the DSN has three stations around the world. One is in Robledo de Chavela, about 35 minutes out from Madrid, the capital city of Spain. One in Goldstone in the Mojave Desert, some 30 minutes north of Barstow here in California and one some 35 minutes from Australia's capital, the city of Canberra in the area of Tindin Villa. So each of the stations is located at 120 degrees apart from the other so that we can give full coverage of the 360 degree circumference um, of the entire uh, view of the universe. Go to slide 10. So how do we talk to our spacecraft? We use antennas here on Earth, and we also use antennas on the spacecraft uh, so that we can talk to them. We use a type of light to communicate with our spacecraft. That light a, has a frequency we call radio frequency for short, but it's actually somewhere between radio and microwave. And that light through our atmosphere as well as through space. The antennas use a lot of advanced methods and equipment to make sure that we stay connected and communicate using the best signal possible. Going to slide 12, actually, I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's go to slide 11 here. And although our DSN antennas were de designed decades ago, and continue functioning very well today, 
due to the future demands for higher amounts of data going through them, especially with missions putting humans back on the moon and on Mars, we are currently working on the design of an optical antenna that will have various frequencies to use and each will be transferring much larger volumes of data than today. With human missions, you see, knowing the health of our astronauts and monitoring their progress will be extremely important in addition to our science goals and spacecraft conditions. So the optical reflector, as you can see on the left side of the view here, is nestled in the center portion of the beam waveguide antenna. So we will actually have two antennas in one, a radio frequency and an optical antenna. Now, going to slide 12, the DSN antennas need a lot of tender care. They are, yes, in top condition and functioning very well today, but that is thanks to the large team of engineers and scientists that we have both at JPL and at each of the three stations working hard every day to maintain, monitor, repair, and modify our current antennas so that they are always ready to work for us, communicating with our spacecraft on time and for the duration necessary. Now, if we go to slide 13, currently we have uh, dozens of missions that we track every day and we are always communicating with one spacecraft or another. And you yourself can actually go to the uh, eyes DSN and look for your look look at that yourself. And on the left side, um, you will see our three stations and what antennas are working. There will be some that are grayed out and some that will show lit up. Those are ready and operational today. The others are maybe uh, under maintenance. And among those, you will see some transmitting data. And on the right, you'll be able to see, you can click on the antenna that is transmitting data. And on the right, you will see a view of that antenna and the name of the spacecraft they are communicating with, how far away that is, and the, uh, the, uh, the round trip distance of the signal. So enjoy and stay connected yourself by looking at what DSN is doing for our spacecrafts, our missions, and all our uh, customers worldwide. So this is the end of my presentation to you and we'll move on with uh, some questions. Awesome, thanks so much, Bernardo. I, I really like that you um, highlighted the uh, DSN eyes component because that's that's the view that we have in spaceflight operations, JPL's mission control. Um, so it's really like you guys are getting to see exactly what we see uh, when we're on lab. Um, you have a ton of questions here. Uh, you drew quite a crowd from a pretty impressive sounding uh, geoengineer in Sacramento to uh, high school students in India. So um, we'll uh, tackle the, the, the top ones first. Um, looking at uh, the current state of DSN, as well as moving to this optical uh, DSOC, um, what are the frequency bands that spacecraft use and, and what powers these communication systems right now? Yes. Um, so we use a variety of frequencies, and that has evolved over, t over time. We, these frequencies are assigned uh, like short names like S-band, X-band, um, uh, KA, and so on. And so the frequencies range anywhere between 1.5 gigahertz to about 34 gigahertz, all right? And um, so, but when we are in, um, in the optical mode in the future, that will be much higher frequency. And the frequency determines 
um, how much data you can put through. And um, so the power that we use, our transmitters are anywhere between um, 20 to um, uh, 100 uh, uh, kilowatt, I mean 80 kilowatt, 20 to 80 kilowatt. Um, so that's a lot of power. Yeah, it brings up an, it brings up an interesting point, which is uh, obviously when it comes to you know data limitations, we can't change the speed of light. Uh, so what what is it? If you don't mind getting into kind of some of the the basic physics for our audience here, why is it that changing the frequency allows us to get more data? Well, um, so the frequency. If you think about you know those those of you who play music. There's such a thing as beat, right? How many beats you get per second or in a given amount of time. So the communication frequency is similar to that, all right? So uh, for example, just with the current frequencies, if we transmit at 1.5 gigahertz, but then we have the capability to transmit at 15 gigahertz, that's 10 times more information that we can fit in one second uh, in any given amount of time. So if we go to optical, that is orders of magnitude higher. So we will, you know, multiply the amount of data that we can get through. Yeah, and maybe. Yeah, and maybe that that uh, segues nicely into why is it that you're exploring DSOC? Uh, so you know, what what is the current state of of the DSN as is, why not just build more antenna? Or you know, why why switch to optical in the first place? So if we build more antennas, um, that is like putting uh, a, a larger telescope in front of our eyes or a larger set of binoculars, but we will still be seeing the same frequencies, okay, or the same amount of data. It's just that, you know, we can see it bigger and better, but the amount of data that's coming to us is still the same. So um, that is why we need to increase the frequency, not only because uh, then we increase the amount of data coming through at any one frequency, but then if we are in the optical area, think of all the colors that, we, uh, that our eyes can see. So that's the optical regime. And so we can see anywhere between red to violet, for example. So each one of those frequencies is like a different channel that we can tune into. So while we have, today we have, you know, say three main channels, uh, in the future we can have more channels. So I guess it, it begs the question, the question, why stop there? So why, why just visible light? Why not infrared? <laughs> well, um, uh, one of the challenges, for example, well, infrared is like lower frequency, right? And um, uh, so we perhaps don't want to go to infrared, um, and uh, but let's go to ultraviolet, uh, for example, uh, or even higher uh, frequencies. Some of the challenges that we have, let's think of uh, ultraviolet, for example. Well, we know that a lot of the ultraviolet uh, radiation that comes from space, uh, predominantly the sun, gets blocked by the ozone layer, for example. So the atmosphere, while it protects us, can play against us. For example, when we are in the optical regime, well, we know that clouds will become an obstruction to that communication. So we'll be able to communicate when the sky is clear. So that will be something that we'll have to play with real time when we are uh, scheduling the communications, but we will also have the other frequencies as backup. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, a, a really good question coming in here is, what is the effective maximum distance that we can communicate both presently and perhaps if we were to implement something like DSOC, and then maybe maybe a bit of a follow up too, what are the what are the hurdles for DSOC? Why, if it if it is so much better and we can get so much more data, why why aren't, aren't we doing it? Yeah. Um, so, 
uh, why haven't we been doing what we project to do in the future? Part of the reason is the need was not quite there. We were able to manage with the technology uh, that we had, but also every time you advance in the capabilities, you're also talking about developing new technologies. Um, putting in an optical portion to the radio frequency antennas uh, is a challenging, very challenging proposition. So we, while we are working today to design that, you know, that it will be years into the future before we implement it, but uh, we have to do so in time for when these uh, 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 human missions um, uh, get executed. Now, in terms of the limitation for um, the distance that we can cover, um, an example of where our reach is today, um, the farthest spacecraft we are tracking are the Voyager mission spacecraft that left Earth some, um, what, uh, if I'm, I'm counting correctly, some 33 or maybe 43 years ago. Um, and the farthest one is uh, a bit more than 21 billion kilometers away. So that is a very, very far distance. And um, so what happens is as you go farther in distance, the power, if you will, of that signal becomes smaller and smaller and smaller because our antennas have just so much um, aperture, if you will, and so much power in transmission, and the, the size of the antennas on those spacecraft um, is already set. So the farther away uh, the spacecraft are is like we talking to someone in the next room, but if, if they start walking away across the street and we're talking with the same level of voice, then you know, it is a lot harder to hear. So those are the physical limitations, right, um, that we have to deal with. Um, kind of going to the idea of the Voyager, um, how is it that we actually keep track? What's what's happening astrometrically, really, to, to be able to keep an eye on spacecraft so far away and be able to, you know, get data across these great distances? What what is that control and tracking and guidance look like? How about now? Sorry about that. Um, so the, the signals have, you know, uh, a very specific coding that we look for, you know. Um, it, it's like, it's, we, we call that a carrier signal. So, so we know when we are tuned to that spacecraft, right? And um, uh, so whenever, so we know where the spacecraft, spacecraft is supposed to be and where it will be, say, nine hours from now when we want to latch on to uh, one of them. Um, so we point our antennas to that position and we send a signal. Um, and then we get the signal back, acknowledging that we have a connection, and then we start communicating. And the data is really coded, like I said, a, a bit, you know, uh, to a certain extent, so that we know uh, within that whole package of information what is diagnostics or health of the spacecraft and what is science. So part of our team of uh, engineers at JPL, um, their job is to decode, you know, and sort out, you know, uh, out of all that data, what are navigation or the health of the spacecraft from the actual science. So that is something we have lots of experience with for decades. And it's a true and tried method that we we'll keep on relying with, uh, relying on uh, to be able to communicate. Um, I, I have a question here uh, that as I, I know a lot of us were asking actually was uh, if you recall during the the latest SpaceX launch, 
the ISS, there was a, a moment where it looked like connection was lost. And there, there, you know, the statement was that this is kind of normal because of perhaps that distance effect you measured in terms of what's local versus what's deep space. Can you elaborate on how that took place and what, what happened there? Um, yeah, I, Brandon, and, and for every, everyone, unfortunately, I don't have the details as to what happened, but I can, in order to illustrate how difficult um, uh, going to space is, let's think of the fact that the environment of our in in on Earth and inside our atmosphere is a certain type of environment. But the further we get away from the surface, the environment starts changing. Not only that our atmosphere is getting uh, thinner, which is actually helpful for the for the communications, but What's happening, we enter into an area with higher temperatures and then a lot more uh, uh, particles, charged particles as we go into the magnetosphere. Um, so we have two main layers of protection um, uh, around our planet. One is the atmosphere um, and the other one is the magnetosphere. And the magnetosphere actually protects our planet from the constant rain, if you will, and storms of particles that come from the sun. So it is often that the Earth gets bombarded by some solar uh, wind and um, uh, flux of higher strength that can actually um, wreak havoc uh, with our telecommunications. So. Um, from time to time, we have to think about protecting our spacecraft from those events. So outside of uh, the magnetosphere, there is a lot going on that uh, can actually cause damage to our telecommunications, but also to the health of the spacecraft. So, you know, those are considerations that we're always dealing with when we have to communicate with our spacecraft. And of course, some of these things could also happen, happen during launch or orbit transfer. Uh, um, kind of in a, in a similar vein, there's a question here that um, seems, seems kind of the, the natural next one to ask, which is um, beyond protecting the, the satellites or our spacecraft from, uh, from natural environments, what about protection from like cyber threats in this day and age? Uh, you know, how, are they, how are they protected? Yeah, so um, our our spacecraft have their own computer systems, right? And also they have their own software operating systems. And uh, while I'm not a software engineer, I can assure you that in the process of developing this software, which we do in you know our computer systems, uh, a JPL or elsewhere, um, we have to protect you know, that development so that we don't get any bugs or threats coming into the spacecraft, just like you said, just like we protect them from contamination and from uh, foreign objects, and we put thermal blankets on them to protect them from high or low temperatures. We also have measures that protect, protect them from uh, viruses in the software to um, you know, so that we have uh, a healthy uh, computer system as well. Um, maybe uh, uh, the last technical question I'll, I'll ask you then is, um, you know, are there are there redundancies in place? How do we, you know, kind of as as an engineer, how is it that we kind of keep everything up and running through, you know, right now through whether it's fires or earthquakes or you know, how, how do we make sure that business is running as usual? Right. So um, fall detection or single catastrophic events for any one mission is something that's always present in our minds. We start, you know, when we start design, designing a mission, that is always there. You know, in the conceptual design through all the maturation phase, uh, phases, we're always asking whether, uh, you know, something is a critical requirement. Uh, you know, for example, okay, the spacecraft has to 
be able to com communicate with our antennas, for example, at such and such frequency. Well, what if the you know what if the transmitter uh, uh, um, you know has a glitch? What is our um, a plan B, if you will? Okay, for so for the DSN, our plan B is um, we have another antenna standing by if it is a critical event. If it is, say, we're going to start um, landing, we're going to be landing on Mars and we're waiting to hear from the rover to say, I'm here, I'm healthy, I made it, you know, I made it home. And uh, so we always have another antenna standing by either at the same complex or maybe at another station that can uh, see Mars uh, from that location of the Earth. So we're always having a plan B. And that is part of the way we operate either on the ground or in, with our spacecraft. And that is key to our, to our success. Perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, I, I want to kind of transition a little bit to, to you. You have a multitude of questions, uh, a little bit about your journey to NASA. We have a huge international audience with us today. So um, a lot of people are wondering, how did you get here? What did, uh, what did school look like? What degrees did you pursue? And uh, what, what got you to NASA in the first place? Yeah, um, good. Uh, thanks for that question. It's very important. You know, it's interesting. I was actually born in um, the country of El Salvador. And as a little kid there, I didn't know exactly what I wanted to do. First of all, I thought, you know, well, university is probably going to be very expensive. I don't know whether I'll be able to study, study the kind of career I would like. Um, and I remember reading an article when I was 12 years old that talked about a comet, uh, code, the code tech and scientists at JPL that were tracking it and studying it. And I thought, it would be nice if I could uh, work there at some point. Well, you never know what opportunities life will offer you. And so, um, you know, keep on studying, right? And that's what I did. And uh, later I found the opportunity. Well, I came to the United States when I was 18 and, um, and I, I enrolled in the university to, um, to study sciences and math, you know, very important to be an engineer, a scientist. Um, and, um, and later I realized that I wanted to be in aerospace. So I went to school for aeronautical engineer, uh, engineering, which is the design uh, of aircraft, but also spacecraft, rockets, and the likes. And uh, I was a good student. I was uh, fortunate that way. And I got a scholarship from a company called TRW Space and Electronics. Now it's North Grumman here in, in, in the Los Angeles area, which guaranteed that I would have a job when I graduated. Um, and I start working there, you know, doing um, structural engineering, doing analysis to make sure that during launch would not fall apart because that's a very shaky um, uh, event. And um, at the time, then I was contacted by someone at JPL who wanted to do some research on new types of structures. And I decided to come to JPL. Later, I realized that, my goodness, this is really where I wanted to be when I was 12 years old. So the message here is, uh, don't put limitations on yourself. Always be ready for the opportunity. Study hard. You know, identify um, a goal and keep your eyes on that goal. Stay on that course and you will eventually get there. And then later you will realize that the opportunities will show up, okay? And you will be surprised um, as to where you are. And I have to tell you, for many of us, uh, if not most of us at JPL and at NASA, I can say, we are, we feel um, privileged and humbled really to be able to do this, not just for the United States, but also for humanity. And many times work is very challenging and very hard, but you know, this is something we cannot ignore. Exploring space, that is our frontier. That's where the future is. And 
So we're committed to doing it. And we need many of you students out there to stay steady. And one, uh, one of these days, you will be doing this kind of work. We have, uh, you know, um, many generations that hopefully will continue this journey. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for that. It's so so perfectly put. Um, I know that that you work with students a lot, and um, when when I speak to students, I try to convey to them that even though I think baseball is the worst sport in the world, that really one of one of the valuable lessons it teaches is that there is a, a incredible value to just getting on base. You don't hit a home run every time. None of us just kind of fell into NASA or JPL. We worked and worked and worked and it kind of just got closer every time. Um, so I think it's a really great message. I appreciate you. Uh, Brandon, Brand, I want to highlight one thing. Um, teamwork is very important. And, you know, uh, uh, it is a key component of what we do. We, we work in teams at JPL, but as you all know, working in teams brings the best of different people and we cannot achieve difficult things alone. So start, start exercising your abilities to work in a team because that is key to the success. Perfectly put. Um, well, with, with that, we'll let you go. Thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And uh, I, I think you've really given us a great great outline for uh, the Deep Space Network and future research. So thank you so much. It's my pleasure. Thank you all. So uh, what I'd like to do now is, is just uh, transition to just a couple quick slides on some of the resources that we have at NASA Education. Um, that way, you know, again, if you if you really enjoyed what you heard today or you have more questions, maybe I can, can point you to the right place to learn a little bit more. Um, on slide one of, of my presentation here, you'll see uh, just a screenshot of the NASA Education website. Um, and you can see, due to uh, everything that's going on right now in, in the California and the West Coast, we have uh, some you know, interesting updates on the science of wildfires. Um, but you'll also notice at the top, there's several options for you guys to peruse through. Um, things like uh, our teach section, which are you know, a little bit more highlighted for teachers. Um, so you know, if you're leading a classroom versus a learn section, which is you know, a little bit more self-guided. Um, in this, whichever section you go to, you're going to find a ton of resources and activities, like you'll see on slide two. Um, one example of this is uh, what we call the solar system scroll. This is kind of predicting and mapping out the relative distance in between all of the planets in our solar system. So for you that were asking, you know, how long does it take to communicate with one planet versus another, um, this will give you a little bit of perspective of just how difficult that truly is. For example, Mars being our nearest neighbor, that's a, that's a quick call, but um, as you'll discover if you do the activity, our planets are not evenly arranged, not evenly spaced out through the solar system. So uh, some of these are really much, much further than, than others. Um, another activity on slide three is uh, this modeling the Earth-Moon system. And this is a great activity just uh, for fun or with young kids. Um, a, a subsection of it is just taking balloons and looking at like the relative size of the Earth versus, as well as the distance in between them using a little bit of math. We're always here to trick you into using a little bit of math. Um, on slide four, um, I, I want to point out that we have not just individual lessons, but actual uh, like unit plans built for, again, a classroom instruction setting. So if you are wondering, you know, how do I tie all these lessons together? We've, we've tried to kind of build that out. Um, our education team is all ex-scientist, ex-teacher, so we really have a good feel for the standards that you need to hit and what kind of narratives we can build into our lessons so that you can kind of see some, some consecutive lessons play out in a really cool way for your kids. Uh, on slide five, if you're looking just to read more, uh, the, the uh, news section, which is full of uh, uh, articles we call teachable moments, written for the layperson to kind of just get a feel for what's happening in the world of NASA and space exploration. So uh, these are constantly updated with, you know, whatever big breaking news is taking place. And our team is making sure that this kind of stays fresh and updated so that you guys can follow along. Uh, on slide six, uh, you'll see, again, a little bit of a, a screenshot of this teach section. And I come back to it because I want to highlight that whether it's today talking about you know, engineering and communication across the solar system or our previous talks that have been on Mars, 
um, you'll see these drop down menus uh, where you can actually you know, pull up the grade level that you're looking for, specific topics. There's a search function, so you can say, you know, I really just want to learn about the moon today, or comets, or uh, you know, building rovers. Um, so it's very, very easy to navigate. Uh, if, again, if you're a teacher, all of these are lesson planned in, in a pseudo 5D model, um, uh, PDFs of assessments, of uh, student worksheets, everything's already made for you. So it's really built to just kind of take off the shelf and run. Um, on slide seven, you'll see the uh, screenshot from that learn section. It looks very familiar, but as I mentioned, it's a little bit more tailored to self-guided learning. And that's turned out to be really helpful these days because many of us uh, in the education community are working in remote instruction. So if you are in a distance learning environment, this allows you to kind of uh, you know, send out cool activities to kids so they can kind of perform it on their own and then come back to your digital classroom and share their work. Uh, so these are a lot more self-authored kind of uh, driven by the student type activities. Uh, on slide eight, you'll see uh, that, you know, uh, the learning space website um, is kind of our attempt to make a nice one stop shop. So if, if even this is too much for you to navigate, um, you'll enjoy being able to run through kind of some more themed and, and packaged activities, uh, whether it's, again, something to do with your students, a video to watch, uh, an assignment to create. We're working tirelessly because we know uh, you know, it's, it's tough for teachers out there. So designing new activities, uh, uh, we're uh, making sure that our uh, lessons get translated into Spanish. Both the videos have uh, subtitles and our worksheets are translated as well. And then of course, just for, for you guys at home, we have just little FAQs for what it is that NASA does, what cool things we're, uh, we're trying to share um, so that you can get involved as well. And then uh, lastly, I'll just point out that, you know, really this is just scratching the surface. There's so many more resources out there. I wanna remind you guys that uh, um, we have workshops just for the education community as well. So this uh, coming Saturday, always the Wednesday uh, is our um, technical talk. The Saturday following, we'll kind of run through and actually model some of these resources for you. So if you are a teacher or if you're homeschooling, we can uh, kind of practice some of these together based on uh, what we heard Bernardo speak about today. So hopefully that provides some continuity and of interest to you, you can register in the exact same place where you found uh, this, this webinar today. So with that, um, I'll probably wrap up. Uh, I hope that today worked well. Uh, the fact that we're still here and I'm speaking to a camera suggests uh, that Lyle Tavernier is, uh, is absolutely a tech wizard. So if you see him in the streets, make sure to wave and say hello. Um, and thank you to, to everyone for continuing to dial in and, and uh, make these events so fun and submitting your questions. I hope you enjoyed and um, really look forward to hearing uh, uh, more next month where we'll be actually talking about astronomy and uh, some of kind of our, um, how we still use light, a very similar theme, but how we use that light to explore the solar system. So um, make sure to uh, check the website, tune in next time and looking forward to seeing you guys again soon.